everyone, and welcome in to Maroon and Bold Season 10, Episode 2. It's still kind of weird that we're in episode or in season 10. I think I joined. Hold on, I gotta I gotta really think through some math here. So if you smell smoke through the through the screen or through the Zoom call here, you're not you're not you're not mistaken. I think I joined season nine. I think I joined like season seven, maybe something like that. Um, not quite sure what the, how the math works out with that one, but eh, whatever. Anyway, I am your host and sports editor, Austin Chastain, along the Zoom call with Christian Boer, staff reporter for Central Michigan Life. And Christian, how are things going for you, man? A couple of weeks down in the semester. How, how are we feeling? How are you doing? Not too bad. You know, we're getting through it, surviving, man. It's not easy, but at the same time, everybody's going through it, so there's no excuses. What about yourself? You know, just uh, I'll kind of take an adage from college basketball in March, man. I'm just surviving and advancing each day. That's 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 all we that's all we can do, really. Um, survive and advance every day. So, you know, great to uh, great to be where we're at and um, taking care of business day after day. So. Gotta be eternally grateful for 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 that for sure. We'll we'll jump right in into some new stuff real quick, and then we'll get to the kind of the bulk of the episode. Um, real quick, the CMU wrestling team announced that it is having COVID nineteen issues and was not able to participate in the quad at Clarion yesterday. We're recording this on Sunday to Saturday. They weren't able to participate on Saturday. Not quite sure if the try in McGurk Arena next weekend is still on. Um, not quite sure how uh, affected the team is by COVID-19. So we'll stay, make sure you stay tuned and we'll keep you updated for that one. Um, I think that try is supposed to host George Mason and Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. So with that, I think that covers just the little bit of, uh, I don't want to say outside news, but covers the little bit of news I wanted to get to before we get to the bulk, because one of the big stories this week, CMU football offensive coordinator and quarterback coach Charlie Fry is Editing, taking his talents down to South Beach and will become the quarterback's coach at, well, with the Miami Dolphins. A pretty big step for, for Charlie Fry, who played quarterback in the MAC and then went and played quarterback in the NFL. Kind of bounced around the college ranks a little bit, and now he's found himself back in the NFL in the coaching role. Christian, you, you, were, our, you were our guy on that story. Tell me a little bit about... Um, if you can, just kind of what Charlie Fry's legacy left is, or what what kind of legacy Charlie Fry's going to leave in just two years at CMU and really a year and a half. I mean, however you want to think about it, but talk to me a little, <clears throat> excuse me, talk to me a little bit about Charlie Fry and just kind of what he means to the program. Yeah, you know, you're going to look, when you look back on his time here, I think you're going to look more at the 2019 season as opposed to the 2020 season. Obviously not a ton CMU could do in 2020 with, you know, the, the struggles at quarterback. Uh, they did always, the one constant under Charlie Fry was they always had a really good run game uh, between Ward and Kobe Lewis and even Lou Nichols came along really well this past season. So um, again, that 2019 team, best, uh, best, offense the Mac uh, in terms of total yards per game and just a lot to a lot to like about the offense and in the, the direction that he took it and now the responsibility lies on Jim McElwain to go find somebody who can kind of keep that core of you know Pimpleton potentially Sullivan obviously we haven't heard uh, if the the seniors are going to take an extra year and if you know if so who so potentially Ja'Cory Sullivan coming back and then obviously running back you've got two of the best returning running backs in the Mid-American Conference. So, again, now the responsibility is on Jim McElwain to go out and get somebody, and I personally think he may not have to look too far. Well, that kind of leads right in, into my next point. I mean, you also put together a kind of a, an opinion slash analysis 
um, of who team you might be able to go get and by not looking far, I think we're thinking internally, don't you think? Yeah, you know, um, I spent a couple hours after the the Charlie Fry news came out, just kind of looking into some potential candidates and what you know. Obviously, Kevin Barbe, he's already this assistant head coach, excuse me, and he's the wide receivers coach. He has offensive coordinator experience. Um, you know, obviously, he works with the best unit. Uh, on a team, the wide receivers, he works with them every single day. So he's real familiar with the offense. I think that in a year where maybe the budget's a little tighter than it usually is, I think maybe promoting internally is a good thing to do. But Fry was also the team's quarterbacks coach. And um, before I straight off that topic, I think another guy just base, you know, the base research that I did yesterday, um, I think Kerry Dixon comes to mind. For, he's at Georgia Tech now, but he's another guy that worked on that staff at Florida with McElwain. And if you look at all the guys that have come here from there, uh, Keith Murphy, uh, Tim Skipper, um, gosh, I'm blanking. Charlie Fry was there and so was Barbe actually. So that's four people who worked with him at Florida and now they're all back. So um, you know, if maybe McElwain wants to get the band back together, maybe you go there um, and go out and get him. Uh, but another name that's intriguing is is Austin Appleby. Uh, maybe not for the potential um, coordinator role, but like I mentioned, Fry was the quarterback's coach, and his obviously now that he's gone, they need one. And obviously you can do some switching and, and change up the roles a bit. I don't know how – different the the wide receivers coaches from the quarterbacks coach I mean one throws the ball to the other so how really how different can it be um but I think if they want to get a a quarterback coach who I mean may not break the bank but also would would bring that familiarity and and bring that cohesiveness obviously he was here in 2019 and he worked with Daniel Richardson and um you know he played a part in recruiting like a Tyler Pape and so I mean, just off the top of my head, those are three candidates. Um, if I had to to guess, I think it would be Kevin Barbe and then potentially Austin Appleby coming in as, as quarterback's coach. Right, and, I mean, Appleby is at Missouri State with, with Ryan Beard, a former special teams coordinator. Um, so I could, see, I could see that. I mean, Appleby played, played quarterback for McElwain at Florida. Uh, and had a lot of success with, with the Gators. So, and I mean, he had some success in, in what he was doing with, with CMU. So I could see, I could see Barbe moving up to the OC position. And then, like you said, Appleby coming in. So I, I as the quarterback coach, I'm right there with you. I, I think that would be uh, probably the way that they should do it, but you know, I'm, we, we don't get paid the big bucks to sit here and, and make those decisions, but it, that uh, you know, we do, we just get to talk about them. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I definitely would agree with that. I think that would be the way to do it. But again, those you know, McElwain and, and those guys get paid the big bucks to make those decisions. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and and, and just kind of one last point. I mean. You can't really fault Fry for going to the NFL, right? I mean, obviously, it's a you know it's kind of a big time job. You're going to go work with Tua Tagovailoa, one of the most prized prospects, both in high school, college, and the NFL. However, you want to go about it. Uh, just kind of thinking ahead. I mean, what kind of success do you think Charlie Fry could have with the Dolphins? Well, I think he's in a good spot. I think that. You know, obviously he's he's more. In my opinion, he's more than ready. I think having been an NFL quarterback and then the the success he had as the OC at CMU, excuse me, really puts him in a good position. And then obviously you read into it a little bit, and you know he worked with Tua at the you know the, the opening or maybe it was the Elite Eleven, and um, uh, so there's some familiarity there. And it was actually the year that kind of Tua blew up in the in terms of the recruiting cycle was the year that he was working with Fry and. Um, obviously they probably asked to, uh, if there was a guy out there that he wanted and, and yeah, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this, this hire is partially because Tua wanted Charlie Fry and, um, obviously they're trying to build around him. So just kind of looking into that on the surface, it, 
it seems as though this is a really good spot for him. And then now, obviously, you, you know, you can't really fault him for leaving. And now if Tua starts having success, now Charlie Fry's in the conversation for maybe an OC or even a head coaching job sometime in the future. So it's the next big step for his career. And that's why I think maybe Central Michigan is – better off looking like at an Austin Appleby who's an up and comer real young in the coaching game and and giving him the opportunity to come here and kind of you know start his journey obviously he wouldn't be here forever but it would be a good solution um, for the short term at least yeah absolutely um yeah I can't say I would disagree with any point that you made there um yeah that's um it's all, all good stuff for sure. Speaking of good stuff, I guess in a way, um, we'll touch on it real quick. The CMU volleyball team had its season opener over the weekend. Uh, it had a very, I don't want to say bizarre, because I mean, they're playing volleyball in January when they normally play in the fall, so it's not that bizarre. Um, and, you know, the power outage on the football season opener there was actually a power outage at Ohio uh over the weekend and in the first match and actually it actually shut down the match in I think the second set at the end of the second set and then they had to come back finish that second set and then play sets three four and five on Saturday morning and then went back there's actually a basketball game in between I think Ohio played against Ball State in the convocation center and then the, the men's team, excuse me, the Ohio men's team played against Ball State. And then they they played the second match, which Ohio earned a sweep. Um, so just kind of a, a, a wild weekend, really, for, for CMU. So um, CMU one and one on the year will return home next weekend. I think they play Kent State. Yes, Kent State in McGurk Arena. First match, I believe, Thursday at 6 p.m. And then Friday at 2 p.m. is the is the second match. I'll double check that. I'll confirm that. Um, also, really quickly wanted to touch on the CMU baseball schedule getting released. Chippewas will play 40 MAC games, which is far more than they've played in, I want to say, ever. Um, at least since 2013, I think they upped the schedule to 27 MAC games uh, from 23. I think they only play uh, 16 non-conference games and two midweek games, which will be a home and home against Notre Dame, which is actually going to be really exciting. I think they go to Notre Dame on, I want to say April 14th, and then they'll host the Irish on May 4th. So kind of uh, kind of exciting to get the baseball s- schedule out there, so you can kind of start thinking about oh who's who's gonna who's gonna play who's gonna play who at, and when. Uh, Chippewas will host five MAC series at home, uh, and then they'll uh, they'll go on the road for five of them. They'll play four game series with single games on Friday and Saturday, and a double header on Saturday. Obviously pending um, you know COVID and, and whatnot and weather because we I remember baseball is huge on weather and tennis and stadium doesn't have lights so darkness is a, another thought process there as well. Uh, Christian we kind of touched on it just real quick before before we, we started here. Any any cool highlights? Obviously the Notre Dame uh, series sticks out but any any thing that's cool it seems like about the baseball schedule you know in looking at it I think at the beginning of the year and it could just be my eyes but it looks like that the they have kind of a bubble set up in Dayton um for a couple of games they're going to get Dayton I think West Virginia comes in there too and they kind of have like a three team whatever so that'll be kind of neat to see uh, again it'll be really interesting to see where this team goes because it you know obviously the last time they played a full season they went to the NCAA tournament and then they had a really good start to the year last year so um going to be going to be neat to see how things turn out and obviously a highly motivated bunch so it should be an exciting group this year 
yeah, highly motivated bunch and a lot of talent returns from that 2019 team. So definitely teams in the MAC need to uh, be on the lookout for sure. Like Christian said, they started out really well last year before the season was cut short um, in, uh, in March. So interesting to see, like Christian said, where it goes and how the team gets started. Um, we'll obviously have more uh, on the baseball team once the season gets a little bit closer. I think that covers all of our newsy stuff. Um, one of the last things we wanted to talk about. CMU women's basketball team went on a three game losing streak. Something I don't think this team has seen, this program has seen in years, probably since the early days of Sue Guevara. Obviously, you don't want to have a three game losing streak. That's a struggle. And throughout that losing streak, Heather Osterley, that coach, kept saying she needs more from her leaders. She needs more from everybody, a little bit more heart, a little bit more fire. And one of the things that she kept saying is we need to be play, we need to play with fire. Play with more fire. And the Chippewas were able to do that. They had struggled in the first quarter, and that's really where the that's one thing that you could point to and say, yep, that is where the struggle lies. Obviously, three-point shooting in uh, last week's game against Eastern Michigan. I mean, they went four for 26. Can't have that in Division One college basketball. But that first quarter, I mean, they were outscored, I think, by double digits in almost every first quarter. Uh, in the last three games, NIU, Ohio, and Eastern. And then they would, outside of the Northern Illinois game, which the Huskies hung 100 over the Chippewas, but the two home games against Ohio and Eastern Michigan, you could see the Chippewas making a comeback. They, they started to play with a little more intensity as the game ran along. And then towards the end of the game, it would make it a close game, whether it's putting a 17 point lead to, to five or cutting a, a 12 point lead to, to two with five seconds left. And then having it come down to a last second shot that sails just wide to set that could have sent it to overtime. Saturday against Akron, the Chippewas came out guns blazing. Christian, you were all over that game, but it seemed like CMU just came out and actually played with some fire against the Zips. Yeah, so the whole the whole thing with that is um, Central Michigan, obviously, you know, you win as many MAC titles in that in a row as they have, and, you know, you become the hunted and, as opposed to the hunter, and it, it can be easy to kind of get into a groove. And, um, you know, Northern Illinois hadn't beat them in, what, 10 years. Eastern Michigan was old for their last, like, 13. Ohio hadn't been successful against them. And these are all teams that are sick of that. They're sick of losing to CMU. And when you when you get that highly motivated and you get a good group of athletes together, it can be, you know, upset city. And so, you know, they get kind of beat up a little bit. And especially in the first quarter, they've been getting punched in the mouth. And what happened on Saturday was a squad that turned from the hunted back into the hunter. And you could just see, I mean, Molly Davis is looking for shots and she's shooting the ball confidently. Jahari Smith around the basket. Uh, Maddie Waters, who's been pretty consistent from the outside, having her best year of her career, you know, from the perimeter, excuse me. And then obviously Michaela Kelly, you know what you're going to get from her. So those four all played really well. Anika Weeks had her first career double-double. It was just a group that looked like it had its swagger back. And um, that that confidence that's going to be needed down the stretch because now you're playing catch up. You're playing from behind. You now you got to catch a Kent State and a Bowling Green. You got to go out there and you have to beat those teams now if you want to win the MAC. So um, a step in the right direction, but the the work is far from done with that squad. Right. I mean, you know, it's it's easy to say, oh yeah, CMU really really beat up on Akron and and yeah, 
and Akron has struggled. I feel like Akron has struggled in almost every sport um, in the last couple of years, maybe except for men's basketball. Um, I'm sure there's some other sports that the Zips are finding success, but in women's basketball, I mean, they, they had a losing record uh, going into yesterday's game, uh, just one and six in the MAC. Uh, I guess one and five going into that game yesterday. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's easy to take a look at the eye candy and say, oh, yeah, they went out and, and dominated that game. CMU's women are back to where they need to be, and, and they could be. We're not sure about that. Um, but, yeah, like Christian said, there's there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of success that CMU needs to go out and find. And this is a good place to start to win, to dominate a game that you should win. That's that's what that's what CMU needs to get back to doing. And that's what Heather Osterley said that CMU needs to get back to doing. So it, it, it'll it be um, intriguing to see if CMU can use this Akron game as a jumping point to go out and, and start dominating games again, kind of like it had in recent years, especially last year. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just really intrigued to see how that's, how that's going to go along. And I believe that starts on Wednesday against Toledo at Toledo. Yes. And then they'll be at home next Saturday, the 30th, on uh, against Buffalo. They'll take on Buffalo in McGurk Arena. So that, that'll be actually – next week will be a really good test for CMU to kind of see – if the if that Akron game is a jumping off point to get back to that dominance, because those are two pretty good, pretty good basketball teams that the Chippewas are going to face off against next week. Yeah, certainly, and you're going to learn a lot about them. So you know, Toledo's a team that they beat them. Toledo actually beat them twice last year. They beat them toward the end of the year, and then they beat them in the MAC tournament. So uh, they're going to play with a chip on their shoulder and give Central Michigan everything they've got. And then obviously, you know, what you're going to get in Buffalo and DeAsia Fair and um, you know, the, all the, all the pieces that they have over there. So again, two really good battles. And if they can go two and oh in that stretch, then I think it's safe to say that they're back to where they need to be. But if, you know, they slip a little bit, the thing is, is that they can't let one bad possession turn into two. And because I think that they were, they kind of came out slow against Ohio because of the sting that that Northern Illinois game left. And then obviously that kind of carries over. So kind of that snowball effect they if they can avoid that and turn things around and yeah Akron isn't a great team but Central Michigan did what they needed to do and go out and dominated and that was one of the problems that they had was that they were giving up too many early runs and then not making runs until late and then obviously against Akron they come out and score the first nine and then you know you get up by as many as 20 and then when Akron cuts that lead to 10 then you reel off like a 15 to 3 run like they did and so that was that was and again not a not a great opponent, but a good performance and it and it shows that they still kind of have that edge that they need to be successful. Right. And and that's exactly it. You can't let little things like that snowball, like you said. Uh, that's the mark of a great team, really, is is that ability to nip a run or not allow mistakes to to swell to astronomical heights where they just can't do anything about it after after a set amount of time. So yeah, big test this week for CMU. Um, like we said, two really good teams. That showdown on Saturday is going to be just ridiculous. It's going to be it's going to be a pretty good basketball game. Make sure you tune into that one. Uh, Really, and I, I think you kind of touched on it already, but what do you think CMU needs to do from here? Maybe it's utilizing the full court press a little bit more, trying to find more minutes off the bench. But in terms of trying to find more success throughout the rest of the season, I mean, we're only, only about a month away from March at this point. 
what does CMU need to do to find success to kind of get the ball rolling and find that find that peak come mid March in Cleveland? Yeah, I think that it all starts with finding consistency off the bench. I think that um, Kira Bustle obviously is struggling, and she struggled again on Saturday. And Anika Weeks played the best game of her season, scoring, you know, I think it was 11 and 10, but it could have been 10 and 11 um, points and rebounds. And, again, she just looked comfortable out there, and I think Anika has been kind of struggling with with really getting into that flow. Obviously, she'll give you six, seven, maybe even eight good minutes and a half, but the problem with her was always that – she kind of struggled with turnovers sometimes, or maybe she wasn't hitting her shots and her potential was on display on Saturday. And I think if she can establish herself as that go-to piece off the bench, that'd be huge because central really hasn't had that. I mean, you look at their scoring, their scoring outputs. It's usually, you know, one of Michaela Kelly and, and Molly Davis has 25 and the other has 20. And then Maddie waters has like between 10 and 15 and that's two thirds of your scoring. So if they can find somebody who can get it going off the bench, I think if Jahari Smith can establish some offensive consistency, she makes them a lot more dangerous. And then, you know, you look at some of the games they were winning early, you know, against Ohio, Callie Martinez had nine points. Um, Sophia Karasinski has had some games where she's hit some three pointers. I know last year after her, you know, she was able to fully heal that knee injury, and she went on a couple of games where she was 13 and I think nine points. Uh, if, she, if she can get to that level, I mean, she's probably not going to play in every game just because of how the minutes are distributed. Um, but when Central Michigan needs some shots to fall, Heather's calling her name. And if, and if Sophia can provide in those, those situations, then, you know, she's another option. And then obviously developing that freshman class and continuing to develop that because there are some really good pieces in there. Carly Crabtree hit her first three-pointer. If she can kind of establish herself as a as a third guard off the bench and uh, maybe maybe kind of push Callie Martinez for some minutes, I think that would be huge. And then obviously, you know, you've got a really talented group in the front court with Sydney Graber and Rachel Luby. Rachel Luby's been pretty good. Uh, defensively anyway she's a really good athlete and if she can turn the bring the offense on she'll be all right too um, she's a good jumper obviously gets in the passing lanes a really good uh, player to be excited about and then city graber with her I think it's more on the offensive end I think the offense is coming around you've seen it she can get to the basket she can shoot the three uh, and again they're both just really versatile players and then Mariama Turkstra um, should they get into foul trouble I think but I think that she's still developing offensively and defensively so again she's more of a of a future piece so but then again if you can get going back to my point if you can get some combination of Graber, Luby, Weeks, Martinez, Kirsinski and maybe Bustle too uh you had them mostly mentioned a lineup shake up and she started the second half with Davis, Kelly, Weeks, Smith and Waters so yeah, uh, there may be a starting lineup sh- uh, shakeup coming, and I think all that's going to do is motivate Kira Bustle. So if she's out of the starting lineup, look for her to come back and fire off one of her trademark twenty to ten games. So again, it's all about depth. It's all about depth, and you know, developing these young pieces so that not not just you don't just have a product for the future, but you've got another option to take some of the load off of a Molly Davis and a Michaela Kelly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've I've seen I've seen uh, Luby get into a couple of different games um, so far this season, and had actually some significant minutes, not just playing in, in garbage time, but um, yeah, you know, and, and like you said, I mean, it, it's all about depth. Great teams have great depth, and and playing in March, be it the MAC tournament, be it the NIT, the NCAA tournament, whatever, what have you, what whichever tournament you want to talk about. You, you t- tend to notice that when, you know, one of the stars is struggling or someone gets into foul trouble, someone can, someone off the bench can step in and, and fill that role smoothly. I mean, filling, you know, someone say, say somehow, uh, you know, Bustle has two fouls in the first half and first, you know, five, 
then it's, you know, first half of the first quarter, I guess. Um, you can uh, kind of have someone step in and having somebody to step in like that is going to be really important as, as the season goes along. And again, as we get into that, into that postseason time frame. So I think there's a lot to be excited about, but you, you kind of have to take it, take that win with a grain of salt until they can reel off another win or win two out of three or something like that. Um, so hold your horses just a little bit, but definitely a lot to be excited about um, with CMU's women's team as the season is kind of rounding rounding third, so to speak, and heading to the home stretch. Um, I think that just about uh, wraps this episode up. You got anything to add, Christian? No, sir. All right. Well, you can uh, make sure to follow along with, with Christian at cboer underscore on Twitter. Follow along with me at Chastain AJ on Twitter. You can follow along with us on, at CM Life, CM Life Sports. On t- both on Twitter, Central Michigan Life, on Facebook, and I believe Instagram as well. We look here for all of our great podcasts. We have so many podcasts this semester. It's fantastic, including one uh, with our fellow staff reporter, Mitch Vosberg and Christian, as they put together and try to revive Unsportsmanlike Conduct, one of my favorite shows. Um, so they'll, they're, they're on that sem- this semester. Make sure to follow along with that. And always for your Chippewa sports coverage and a coverage around Central Michigan, go to cm-life.com. For Christian, I'm Austin and our wonderful podcast and multimedia editor, Ben Ackley. I'm Austin Chastain. We'll talk to you guys again next week when we talk again.